you know, one out of every 10 workers is a salesperson. Mm -hmm. They are the pointy end of the spear for every organization in the world. They, their success determines the top line of every organization in the world. And yet they use generic tools, generic phone, generic software. Even CRM is like basically a generic database, slightly customized for the sales manager. Yeah. If you make software for the end user salesperson, they will be more successful. If they are more successful, they will make more money. If they have more money, they'll pay for the software. Ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Boom. Matthew, thank you so much for coming on. Happy to do it, man. I'm so Good excited to, to chat. Uh, you uh, founded Yesware. We'll talk about that, but I'm excited. You get to do this again after nine years-ish yep. um, to start up with yep. Bodes Well. And when did that, is the my, product available? I know. No, it's not available. Uh, so this is my third Greenfield startup. Oh. And um, it feels so good, actually, to like start fresh and kind of build from the ground up again, given I learned so much from Yesware and my first startup as well. And so it's like so fun to just hit it hard. What, I mean, uh, at a high level, what, when you start looking at the new idea, right? What yeah. is, what are, what are some of the core tenants that you want to bring into this new startup? Um, so my opportunity analysis filter is maybe a little different than the business school opportunity analysis filter, but it generally boils down to like, what am I personally inspired to do and what personal problems do, do I face that um, other people face also? So like, can I, have I empathetically struggled with this issue before? So okay. with Yesware, I was a VP of sales up in front of board members, giving them my pipeline and realizing like I had no idea what my pipeline was actually doing. And so where's the data for that? Well, it's an email. If you can get into email, you get all the data. And that was the inspiration for Yesware. Solve your own problem. With Bodeswell, it's like me and lots and lots of people like me that I know, like everyone who works at Yesware, everyone who works at all these technology companies, everyone who falls into this category called mass affluent, mm -hmm. um, wakes up in the middle of the night and thinks, can I live the life I want to live? Can I send my kids to college? Can I pay for mom's long-term care? Can I buy the house in the lake? Can I take a year off and travel? Can I, you know, retire at 50, not 60, not 70? Well, like, how is this going to work out? Like, is this life going to work out? Yeah, and am so, I making the right decisions? Am today? I making the right decisions? And then how do I get there? And so Bodeswell is basically like a telescope that you can use to look into the future and plan your life to say, oh, no, I got to take that route. And, oh, I got to do this instead. And help me chart the course to see if it's all going to work out or not. Now, is that model going to be primarily consumer? I don't know yet. <laughs> okay, so it's that early. <laughs> At this moment, yeah, we're building, we've built like a first closed beta version of the product, mm -hmm. put it out in front of a bunch of people, did a bunch of user interviews, and uh, now we're iterating on all that feedback, and then we're going to try to figure out B to C, B to B, B to B to C, B yeah. to C to B, like... I mean, early days on the business model. On the Sware side, I think then the total funding was around forty million. Is 50. that yeah, fifty um, over you know uh, years? Uh, what like what did you learn about like? Because I feel like in the early days of this, the email automate like today is pretty ubiquitous. Everybody knows about the tools out there, um, but you guys were really early, right? So, so you want to solve that problem, but like, did you have to educate the market that this is something they should be doing? Because lead gen used to be a marketing thing, yeah. You know, not so much a sales thing, yeah. And then it seems like sales started creating their own opportunities, yep. And um, well, sales always created their own opportunities, like yeah. the classic, yeah, the sales classic, person. Of, yeah. But um, f for Yesware, what and and basically for all three of my projects, like what I'm looking for in the very early stages of uh, user testing is like the glint in the eye. When you put the product in front of some person and say like, do, try it to do this, do you get the glint in the eye within like 10 or 15 seconds? And if you can, if you can deliver that kind of magic moment to a user who's never seen this thing before, then like, you've got it. And with Yesware, we had one feature, we built the templates feature first. Okay. And I tested a bunch of people at this incubator. 
and there was no glint in the eye. <laughs> like, like it's a useful thing. Yeah, it's an, there's no, yeah. it's not sexy. There's no sex appeal. Yeah. With the email tracking thing, like as soon as the person saw the alert, you oh. know, Matthew opened your email. It's like, bing, you know, and I could see the wheels turning in people's eyes. So that that to me was like that feature that sort of opened the door. And um, and then everything kind of followed on from there, which is to say, well, sales is not just email tracking, right? Sales is building a relationship. Sales is communicating genuinely. Sales is saving all my stuff into my CRM so I don't have to do it. Like there's lots, of, then being a manager, man, running a team, but like lots of other things. But you need that initial hook, that magic moment. And once people get that, then you can build around it. Then you then you earn their trust and their credibility, and they're like, "Oh, I want to learn more." Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that immediate hook, then like software is kind of boring, and like, "Oh, my boss is telling me to do this." I'm use this tool. It doesn't. It's not. It's not interesting. Yeah. Frankly. And one of the things that you guys are really well known for is the freemium version of the product. And I know you guys monetize later. I remember talking to you last time I was yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did and it was early distribution always free? Like what? Like what? It started out free altogether, and then um, maybe because it was it a Chrome extension or it, something? Yep, Chrome extension what exactly. Was, I yep. mean, I'm dating myself. Was there Chrome extensions back then? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's so weird. It was like early. It was a, yeah, <laughs> it was early in the like, world. Was, there of was, Chrome I don't know if there was a Chrome extension <laughs> app store. There was. There was an app store. Okay, we totally lucked into that thing. Okay. I mean, and and honestly. Um, finding the Chrome store and the extension distribution channel altogether was a major factor because suddenly, you know, we start we put the thing on an app and a Chrome extension. We suddenly started getting like ten users a day, then fifty users a day, then a hundred users a day, then a thousand users a day. Now we get like ten thousand free users a month from the Chrome store, Whoa. and for free. And as you can imagine, like as you know, as a startup, like that's Incredible. that's what you need to get the water moving under the bow, yeah. so you can figure out what's working and what's not. Yeah. So thank you to Google. Every time I see people from Google, I say thank, thank you for you. the Chrome Store. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, and then yeah, and then um, we did free because I didn't know if anyone would buy it. Yeah. And I didn't. We didn't start charging for it until someone Ben Sardella. Formerly of Kiss Metrics, sent me an e an invoice. Uh, sent me an email and said, "I want to be your first customer. Charge send me, send me your invoice. first invoice because I want invoice." And how long was yesterday. that from product availability? That was about six months, okay. maybe five months. So I cut him an invoice for five bucks. <laughs> you know, or maybe it was like sixty bucks for the year. Yeah. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, uh, and uh, and that was the first sale. And then, literally, like people would stop me in the street and say, "Like you got to charge me more," and that's. All the people who say you can't raise prices after you launch something are wrong. Like, if you have a good product, and you're saying raise prices on the whole user base. Yeah. yeah, like we started at free, then we raised, then we had a paid version at five, and then we raised it to ten, then we raised now it's fifteen, and we have many plans. That what are did you separate 15. that made? What was the for the free line in regards to the trial? At yes, where originally yeah. it was like number of tracked emails. Okay, so was that was like a good value thing. metric. Yeah, yeah. And then, so they paid the five bucks and then eventually the 10 to get that. And then was there a clear um, kind of how does this play out into being a big, because I mean, you guys raised venture capital. Yep. Like what was the vision back in the early days around what this was going to be, like, where it was going to sit inside the enterprise? Like how is this going to be a hundred million yeah. dollar company? Yeah. Um, the, the pitch was basically... Um, you know, one out of every 10 workers is a salesperson. Mm -hmm. They are the pointy end of the spear for every organization in the world. They, their success determines the top line of every organization in the world. And yet they use generic tools, generic phone, generic software. Even CRM is like basically a generic database, slightly customized for the sales manager. Yeah. If you make software for the end user salesperson, they will be more successful. If they are more successful, they will make more money. If they have more money, they'll pay for the software. Mm. Like that's, that's in essence the business plan. So the customer was a sales, so that's an interesting distinction, not a sales manager, No, right? You wanted to make sure the salesperson got value and was more productive. And did that help guide features and oh, yeah. roadmap? 
Yeah, in fact, it, that was having that clarity of who the end user customer was, like without any distraction, was super helpful. It got harder when we got sales managers calling us and saying, "Hey, I got ten people on my team using your product. How can I use it too? How can it help me?" And then we had two customers: we had the end user salesperson and the and the sales manager. And then we got the calls from the VPs of sales saying, "I got five managers." 10 people each, how do I see, the, what view do I use, you know? Um, but that's just part of growing up so as a you, company. So you actually were cool if it was just an individual salesperson, and I'm assuming that's what it was, they would just use it for themselves. They yep. didn't care if the, the company, they just thought it was like that they, powerful and useful. They, they made more money using Yesware, so they'd pay the 10 or 15 bucks a month to do it. Where'd the name come from? Uh, well, I figured we were gonna make software for salespeople. And it wasn't hardware. It wasn't just going to be hardware. It wasn't just going to be software. It was going to be anything that helps a salesperson close a deal. Okay. So it's yesware. So in the early days, there was a vision to maybe like build a sales-specific phone, a sales-specific, like even on the hardware Look, side. It still could happen, man. Yeah. I mean, this thing's yeah, yeah. just it's getting going. Days. It's like yeah. we're, we're not even 10 years old. So yeah. I could see, yeah, I could see all kinds of stuff. That's really cool. And so the freemium, when, when did you make the choice to go free trial and move away from freemium? That was roughly speaking 2000, must have been 14 or 15. Okay, so about four years yeah, ago. Yeah, four or five years. And what was yeah. the pushback when you did that? Or, or was there a fear, like making that decision? Yeah, the fear was that... Because you have this distribution that works on it, word of mouth. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, and, and we're essentially um, going to test it. And we're going to like potentially cut off our knees. Yeah. Um, and obviously, we thought about this a lot, and For we sure. did a lot of user studies, and we did a lot of, a lot of soul searching. It took a year to drum up the courage to do it, but we had like uh, over a hundred thousand free users on the software, yeah. and like they just they weren't converting, they weren't buying it, they were just using it for free, and maybe that's okay, but for a enterprise focused software product that needs to narrow our target market so we can deliver a great product for our core customer, yeah. the free folks were somewhat of a distraction. Because you really have two products at that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, now we have the free product for the end users who are never going to pay. Okay. We have the trial. We have the salesperson product. We have the sales manager product and the sales VP product. And then we have to take care of the sales operations folks too. Sales on, yeah. So you got six different, for a small team of like 100 people, it was a distraction. Yeah. And so after much discussion and, um, you know, this is a board level decision, basically. Mm -hmm. We presented to the board that we would think we should do this. And um, and then we, you know, we did all the underlying work and then we built this blog post and interactive thing to tell people why we were doing it and what we were gonna use the money for and why it was important to pay for the software. And, um, and then we did it and we promptly had like the best revenue month Ever. It's crazy. Because so many people converted from free to paid. And there were like t literally two or three people who tweeted about, you know, F yesware. Yeah. But we kind of put we put other free alternatives in the communication. So people So there were other companies switch. that came around at that, at that point. point. Yeah. At that point people were. And you're like, hey, like, go use this. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't want to leave you hanging. It's just yeah. we can't, you know, we're trying to build a sustainable business. This doesn't work for us. Yeah. Um what like so is freemium going to be part like because that's always a debate like i'm uh i guess i'm just more of a pay me if i create value kind of guy but i also understand the distribution challenges just because it's a more honest feedback loop but do you feel like having experienced a really successful freemium solution that that might be in your playbook always going forward in software or do you have you wh where do you stand on this now um for bodes well, so so for when I advise companies, mm -hmm. I I'm not like one way or or no way. Like you know, you you have to figure it out for your particular situation, yeah. audience, your particular channel, your particular price point, etc. I think freemium is still very relevant for uh, professional software for sure. So prosumer, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you kind of need it for consumer, yeah. Um, so, like, I don't, I'm not biased against it, but 
it's got to serve a very clear purpose and it's got to be like you got to put some bounds around it that say like within these bounds some it makes sense yeah. and outside these bounds like it's it's breaking our business um, so for Bodeswell um, we will definitely have a free trial mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if we'll have a freemium version but we might yeah I just don't know yet <laughs> TBD yeah that's interesting. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, people say that freemium is a marketing decision, distribution decision, not a kind of business model decision of like. It's a product decision too. Yeah. Um, it's a sales decision. because It's a company decision because like salespeople are competing with the free product, mm -hmm. you know, and we did get pushback from potential customers who said, well, your free product's pretty good. Like, I'm not sure I need to buy your thing. And we would just sort of say like, well, okay, I can, you can use it, you know. And that's to a salesperson who's trying to make a number, like that's not a great answer. Yeah. So it it really is a company decision. And it is possible to change, obviously, but it's it's hard. I You know, it's really hard in the midst of the battle to figure out where you're going, you know what yeah. I mean? And so um, the startup battle. And so uh, I just feel that I kind of rushed headlong into the battle a little too much sometimes at Yesware in motivation to get things done, you know? And, um, and Brad Feld actually had a great line for me occasionally. He would say, Matthew, slow down to speed up. Mm -hmm. Take a minute. Pause, think about it, assess the situation, talk to some people, let me introduce you to some people. And then once you know what you want to do, then go forward, you know. So I try to remind yourself remind of that. myself of that. Like, you know, it's you gotta move fast, you can't slack, whatever. Yeah. On the other hand, like get some other viewpoints. It's cause once you make a decision like that, it's kinda it's hard to unroll it. So yeah. And I mean, what other kind of lessons do you feel you've learned at Yesware that you're going to be oh taking? God. I know, I know we don't, yeah, you could do a whole master class a couple of days on this, but like, what are the big ones that are not so obvious um, or a bit unique that you think um, you're going to take forward? Um, so, you know, I went into Yesware and I thought software for salespeople, and that was the full extent of our positioning and our targeting. Yeah. And because we had this sort of very horizontal product, like it it worked, yeah. but then we struggled with narrowing as we went. And um, now I, for Bodeswell, I have one specific person who I know who is the center of the target market. Yeah, Like that it's, that, it's that drilled in. Yeah. And maybe that's too narrow, but like at least I can go talk to Dave and I can say, here's what we've got. What do you think? You know yeah. what I mean? And there are more people like Dave out there in the yeah. world. Um, so that's one. God, there's just, I, I learned so much from that experience. So, And the reason why you decided to do that specific thing, understanding your ICP or your core customer was because in building Yesware, you felt like it was tough to make decisions because it was a moving target on who you were going to serve? Yeah, we didn't, I, I didn't want to a priori decide who the target was because yeah. I didn't know who would use this new thing. And I, and, um, and then when people start using your thing and loving it and tweeting about it and talking about it and coming up to you asking them to charge them money for it, like yeah. it's hard to turn them away. Yeah, it feels good. You never know who you're going to, where you're going to get another 10 bucks a month. So you take yeah. the money, you know, and yeah. it's like, I think that was right to do, yeah. but then you get to a certain scale, like a million, two million, three million ARR, and suddenly, like you see the opportunity in front, and it's hard to narrow from there. It means saying no to some other people. You got to say no. And right now, at yes, we're like actually, I would say over the last year. So I, I, I um, asked Joel Stevenson to step in as, as CEO, CEO yeah. about a year ago. Yeah. And a lot of the work that he's done with the new executive team is basically figure out the core customer for us. We're going forward. Yeah. And now they're really starting to serve that core customer. And you see it in the numbers. You see it in the reviews. Like it's getting this, this real adoption amongst this core high value you know, group. Um, but it means de facto that we're disappointing some other people. 
And that's just like, that's the price of growing. Especially as, as a founder that built something, you just want anybody to want to pay attention, use it. I, and I'm the kind of guy that likes to be liked, you know, yeah. I want everyone to like me. I, you know, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you don't I want, people I don't want no to people off, you know? And so it's kind of, I mean, I, so now I'm, now I'm turning that dial a little bit mm-hmm. with the next one and be like, you know, this is not for everybody. Yeah. Is this for like people say like Gen X financial yeah. planning must be Gen X? I'm like, well, oh, so they say they say uh, they say millennials. millennials yeah. Everyone's building software for millennials, and I'm like, well, like, millennials could use it, but really, it's Gen X. Yeah, Gen X mass affluent. You know, no, it's uh, sorry. Like I, I want to give it away to everyone in high school and college. If you yeah. have a .edu, you can use Bodes Well for free at some point, but right now it's like we need to focus on our core customer. What have you learned about capitalizing the business? Okay, so <laughs> my take on this now is, uh, so we had we had venture capital investment from the beginning at Yesware. Yeah, because of your previous success. And- Go- no, no, at, at Yesware. Okay. I mean, it wasn't because of my previous success. It was because Rich Miner at Google Ventures uh, was into the idea. Yeah. And then I got to know Brad Feld at Foundry through Raj Bhagavat. And and they like software for salespeople. Big market could be a hundred million dollar business. Yes, we're in. Like that's how it kind of came together. Wow. What was the first check? How big was it? One point two million. That's crazy. And there was a prototype. Uh, <laughs> there was the a, template prototype. It was a very rough, mostly functional prototype. Yeah. Yeah. That Cashman built and. God bless Cash. Yeah. <laughs> like I never could have built that. Yeah. What he built in such a short period of time. So we had something that showed we could do it. And in the first board meeting, Brad and Rich said, do you really want to bring this thing to market? Or do you want to just start fresh? And I was kind of like, can we do that? Give, and yeah. he was like, yeah, start fresh if you want. Throw it away. Um, but anyway, the, the, <coughs> the point is that like I think the ideal – capital structure for a startup is for the common shareholders of a startup which is the you know the, the foundry team, team and the and the employees yep. is bootstrap it as much as you can to about 10 million ARR mm-hmm. and once you get to 10 or 15 million ARR then like there's a world of financial debt financing uh, revenue based finance the, all non dilutive capital all those things come up, come to play and the yeah. and the growth guys will come in and they'll they'll put 20 million on the balance sheet and give 10 million to secondary and you know, and you're good. Yeah. Um, so that would, that's, that's your guidance today. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. yeah. Do you, do, and, and that's where you see some companies. I mean, that's, that's what's interesting about the data. I mean, 10 years ago, there was not the amount of information around, you know, equity structure, compensation, you know, like public. I mean, there was, uh, even today, I think there's only 55 publicly traded SaaS companies. Like, it's not a lot. Is that right? Yeah, it's not a lot. You huh. think you think there's hundreds. Yeah. Um, you know, I believe Gail from Constant Contact was the first, you know? A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, yeah, she was certainly one of the first. There first was, to go IPO, SaaS. Huh. What a SaaS model was Gail. There's a... Um, there's a company in Manchester, New Hampshire, also that I, was a training company that was kind of SaaS before. We used to call it ASP. Oh, I remember. Remember yeah, ASP? application service <laughs> provider? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and now, it's but Gail is a pioneer. Like 100%. whether or not she was the first, she was an absolute pioneer for Boston, for being a CEO in SaaS, for yeah. doing what she did. Talk about stick to itiveness and power. That's crazy, Gail Goodman. Yeah, she she when we were building Flowtown, she actually went out of her way to meet us at our office in San Francisco <sighs> to just connect and mm. and and she was super curious about what we were doing around social and email and and she actually shared with us kind of like her early days of building, you know, a v, people understand VSB, very small business. Yeah. There's there's SMB, but yeah. then there's like, you know, the solopreneur hair shop stylist. Yeah. One that to has, five. Yeah, it's so, I mean, you know, your your churn rate is a byproduct of just business failure rate, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's um, right. And I thought that was, hearing that story really gave me a lot of respect for what she created. Um, that's another thing. Two more things Constant Contact did. One is be super data-driven with mm-hmm. That kind of VSB, SMB target, you have to be super data driven. And they really pioneered that in the Boston area. And Wayfarer and, you know, many other companies have learned from that. Um, And two, the high touch customer service model, like every single person who signs up for Constant Contact gets a phone call. And that, 
you know, is doesn't Not intuitive, scale, yeah. whatever, but like they have run the numbers on that and it works. Yeah. That if you talk to a live person, yeah. your retention goes up. It's, it's interesting how, um, tech founders want to do things that are automated and scalable. I mean, arguably, yes, we're allowed people to do things that were um, more uh, automated for a salesperson, but really to, to help them personalize it. One thing I've always been curious is, and I know, I think you guys worked with Infer around account-based marketing, and um, how did, like, how did you guys uh, think about providing the salesperson a- insights into their activity. Yeah. Like if you, if you could paint the picture of where, y- if Yesware was built out to where you think it was the potential, what would it look like as an experience for a salesperson? Like what was that vision? Yeah, so um, two, two aspects of that. And we, we have made inroads and progress on both aspects, but it's not nearly done. Mm-hmm. So the first aspect is the real time, like the pulse. What's happening out there in the world? In the world of my accounts, my contacts, relationships, my relationships, yeah. like w- what's going on? So I want to know, like, is the person interested? Or are they not interested? Are they reading my thing? Or are they not reading my thing? Are they forwarding around? Or are they not forwarding around? Like, like, are they thinking about me or not? Are they traveling or are they at the home office? Are they coming to visit me or are they not? Like, the real-time data is so important, and that's why from the very beginning we pushed to make this thing as real-time as we could. And we wanted to make it like a 100 millisecond lag at the most, you know. Um, it doesn't always work that way because email is complicated and at scale, but that's the goal. And then the second part is the analytics. So as I'm doing my thing, help me get better. So I'm not, I'm not waiting for someone to do something. I'm producing some content. I'm writing an email. I'm writing a reply. Help me get better at doing that. Help me get faster, more efficient, but also more personal and more real and more genuine. Um, and that's, I feel like that's the thing that separates the great salespeople from the good salespeople. Whereas if you... And that's why writing... And that's where technology makes a lot of sense yeah, to support that. It can help you um, because it knows it can know more about the people you're writing at to. At scale, yeah. At scale. And it can and it can encourage you to be a better writer. You know, I would love to put like strunk and white into yesware. And so yeah. as you're typing it, it's like that's a passive construction of a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But an E. B. White's like hilarious yeah. little yeah, you know, yeah. dry mainer kind of Easter thing. eggs in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and so where it's going, I think I think you'll see us continue on both of those paths, um, but for a range, a wider range of communication. Mm-hmm. So not just calendars and meetings and emails and and phone calls, but all the ways that salespeople communicate with prospects, yeah. and then um, a deeper and richer sense of the person that you're writing to. And where are they at? Where are they at in the buying cycle? Where are they at in their career? Where are they at? What do they need? Because if we can be more responsive to another, to the the prospect, then we don't need to bother the people that are not prospects. Yeah. And and frankly, B two B spam is a huge problem. Big problem. And it's going to burn the entire opportunity for all the sales software providers out there because we saw it with the internet and banner ads and you know banner emails and all yeah, this stuff like yeah marketers ruin everything if you overuse a channel it gets burned out and so it's much better now to be like no no actually we're not about blasting out in fact we say to prospects like if you're just about mass 300 blast. emails a day from each rep like we don't want to work with you yeah there are other companies out there that'll take your business but that's not for us we really want to work with companies that want to help their salespeople build genuine relationships with customers and prospects. Go slow to go fast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah personalize exactly. it, make it more interesting. Um, I I remember reading the Yesware blog. You know, you guys wrote some epic content. How did you guys think about that, you know, value as an organization to produce content for your market? You know, some people do it well, some people don't. Well, our f- Cashman and my first business was actually a content business. So it was a media company in 2000, early 2000s. And so we knew about writing and we knew the power of writing good content and inspiring a community to participate and then contribute. Um, so it was based on that. And then it was based on the fact that like no one was writing for salespeople mm-hmm. and salespeople want to get better at their job. And so if we could, we figured we could do that with a data-driven approach, that would work. And then we found um, this woman named Bernie Reader, 
who was at an early customer of ours, Forrester Research, and she took that ball and ran with it. And she basically galvanized our blog. Did you hire her? And we, yeah, we hired her. Wow. And she she was like, let's go. <laughs> and it this. was amazing. She found some amazing freelancers. She found some amazing contributors. And she hired a, a small team. And, uh, you know, she took that blog from, like, my posts, which were 20,000 readers a month kind of thing, to four or 500,000 readers a month. Wow. It's, like, one of the biggest. Yeah. B2B blogs on the web, actually. Yeah, it's a great example of, uh, you know, content inbound, um, really educating the market. I yeah. think a lot of products, there, there's the tool and then there's the best practices around it. Um, and what's cool is that if you do it right, your marketing will serve more people than your product ever will. Yes, exactly. If you do it right. Exactly. And that was part of the idea. It's like, we want to make software for salespeople, but not everywhere can use our stuff because yeah. they're on different platforms or whatever. Yeah. They can all use the article about how to construct a good subject line. Yeah. How do you, Matthew, um, kind of continue to learn? Like, what's your your style of overcoming challenges or hard situations? Like, what's your go-to? Are you a, a reader? Are you, you have advisors? <laughs> do you attack it head on? I am a... Uh, <laughs> that's a really good question. I got to think about that for a second. Uh I'm like a feel the gut punch kind of guy. Like it's kind of got to hurt <laughs> physically. <laughs> and if it hurts, then it's like motivation to deal with it. Um, so I, I spend some time every day like trying to connect with my body and connect with my actual feelings. Is that the meditation side? Meditation or exercise or just like basic mindfulness practice of yeah. Walking down the street and not checking my phone all the time or listening yeah. to music, but just looking around. Like I love sitting in airport lobbies and waiting for the plane and just not doing anything, yeah. and just being bored. And and be okay with and, being bored. And it's fine. People don't look like it's funny. We don't look up anymore when we walk. Like just to like yeah. look at. And if you do, people are like, "What's he looking at? Is there something up there?" It's Actually, like, they're just not. Be, yeah, nobody notices. Yeah. What I've come to realize by being bored in airport lobbies is no one even Nobody's cares because attention. they don't care. They're, they've got their own thing. So it's absolutely like th – th <laughs> I, I felt self-conscious about it at one, for a while, but I realized like they actually don't even notice. So when you say oneness, is it like just um, being in tune with your body? Yeah. Yeah, and just like for you, the, it's like a gut thing. Like if, you, if there's some discomfort there, that's when you're like, okay, I got to address yeah, this. Yeah, that's like a signal. Yeah, and is that like a certain spiritual practice or like how did you come to, to that realization? Um, I, I mean, I, I came to it through sitting meditation practice, mm -hmm. but I think it's universal. Yeah. Like I don't think it's, I, I mean, that's just one route. Yeah. Um, but I think people that, Anybody that does any kind of discipline. Yeah, like yoga. Yoga, yeah. training for sports. Uh, yeah. you become know, aware. Flower it's arranging, yeah. painting, videography, you know. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, um, growing up is about becoming more and more in tune with your world. Mm. Becoming more and more aware of what's happening and becoming more uh, connected to other people. And realizing that, um, you know, this other person has a whole life and this is our moment together. And so let's not miss that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, so when that doesn't feel good, like when there's pain there or discomfort or trouble or frustration, like that's a sign of like, oh, well, let's go into that. There's something let's there. check that out. Let's check yeah. that out, you know? And, um, you know, with me, with lots of people, like there's a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, as a founder, I mean, that's there's just, just a lot of it. Yeah. And then when you say you're pro meditation, is there a specific practice that you like TM or? Um, so I uh, mostly, well, for 25 years, I basically practiced in the sort of American Buddhist world of sitting meditation, yeah. which um, me particularly uh, connected more with the folks who came from Tibet mm -hmm. and started teaching Tibetan, American versions of Tibetan meditation practices. Um, and now I still do that, but I'm much more onto the American side of things. Like mm -hmm. I think there are some incredible American meditation teachers that have 
practice for 15 or 20 or 30 years and actually have embodied the teachings for this culture in a way that it's really powerful. Yeah, it's practical. Yeah. And is that like if somebody, a family member, a good friend of yours comes to you and says, hey, man, I'm dealing with this turmoil, is that one of the first things you would expose them to or suggest to them? No. <laughs> okay. It's not a cure-all for It's you. definitely not a cure-all. And it's definitely not something that's like a quick fix. Yeah. Um, but for... For people who say like, like actually a guy came up to me yesterday after a panel I did, and he said, how should I deal with startup stress? And can you give me a book to read? You know, it wasn't like a, it wasn't a, 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 specific, a specific thing, thing that was happening right now. It was like more like, I need to get better yeah, at this. Dealing with. I want to get better at dealing with the stress. And so for that, like starting a meditation practice is great. Mm. Because you can slowly, incrementally build up. But it's just like going to the gym. You don't go to the gym and try to bench press 250. Yeah. Right? You go to the gym and you bench press 20. And then you do that for a week. And then you do 25. And you, so sitting meditation, same thing. You don't go and try to sit for an hour. Like it would be just... What's the longest you've ever meditated for? Uh, three months. You meditate for three months? Well, not, I mean, I was at a retreat for three months. And how many hours a day would you meditate? Like 12. Holy crap. I thought you were going to say like two hours <laughs> and I would have been impressed. My head just exploded. <laughs> Holy crap. I mean, when you, a lot of people do it. It's, it's funny. Not, as soon as you said that to me, my brain said, you don't want to go there, Dan. Like that's exactly <laughs> what my mind's like. Don't, you don't want to know what's in there. Oh, that's interesting. Isn't that interesting? Huh. Yeah. What did, did you, like, I mean, I'm assuming like you're, exploring the deep bowel of your psyche at that level. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, at some, some state, some points, you know, yeah. but it's like, it's like nothing really changes. Okay. Like do you, you have like psychedelic experience esque, like, do you, do you ever get into these moments of like outside of your body when you're meditating that in, much? in sitting meditation? Well, it's interesting. Like it does happen. And the basic instruction is like, that's just thinking. Mm. That is not a big deal. That's not what you're going for. You're not going for some altered state. You're not going for some woo woo kind of spiritual thing. Yeah. That's just your thoughts. So just bring your awareness back. When you realize that's happening, just bring your awareness back to your body. No different Feel than your being breath. Distracted. It's the same. It really is. It's your thoughts. Wow. So that's not the point. The yeah. point is to like, be present yeah. in the moment. What are your thoughts around visualization and, you know, the word manifestation, but essentially just being intentional about images that you want to achieve, goals, outcomes? Yeah, that's a very tried and true technique across many different spiritual and athletic, um, you know, disciplines. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember in, I think it was the 1976 Winter Olympics, I remember being at home and watching Phil and Steve Mayer, two of the premier early American ski racers, and they were twins, they were younger and older brother, and they were sitting next to each other in their ski suit, and they were doing this before the race. Like, they were visualizing each turn of a slalom course. Yeah. And, and so that this is, again, not a Buddhist thing. This is no. something that everybody does to visual, to get better in practice and get yeah. ready for a big I, thing. As a skateboarder growing up, like, I saw yes. the board. Like, it was, you would never just say, I'm going to do a kickflip and think, I'm going to magically yeah. do a kickflip. Yeah. You literally have to picture in your mind and think about where your feet and the flick and the how you're going to catch the board and yeah. land on it over those trucks. Like, it's so funny when you bring this to people, they're like, oh, that's too woo you know, your visualization manifestation. It's like, no, it's just like, it's, it's what athletes do. It's what high performance, it's kind of like what founders do. We, we visualize the future. We're essentially, it's like in our minds, it already exists. We're just having to get everybody else to catch up to yeah. what we're creating here. Someone, someone told me that like entrepreneurs are basically people that tell lies until they become true. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> It's interesting. As soon as you say that, then I think Theranos, and I'm like, well, sometimes they sometimes don't. They, they, don't, don't work right? out. they don't catch up. They don't become true quick enough. Well, I think, yeah, I agree. And also sometimes people are lying. Yeah. You know, and they're not following through on what they say they're doing, and they're spinning a tale that yeah, they're not being honest with themselves, and that's- It's a fine line. That's a disappointment. Yeah. 
Matthew, as you've gone through this journey, three companies now, um, who have you had to become to be the CEO, you know, from a habits and mindset and beliefs point of view? I mean, I had to grow up a lot. And what were some of those areas that you had to work on? Um, I had to, um, well, a couple things come to mind immediately. One is I I had to just uh, be a lot less um, self-centered and a lot more concerned about other people, concerned about the customer and their world, their needs, concerned about the team and their needs, what they were going through, as opposed to what was out. Like, prioritize the needs of your executives or in your and your team, your company, your startup founder, your friend, you know, your coworkers. Um, same with investors. Same with, and then that helped me actually be a better husband, to be a better father, because like then I started to realize, wait a minute, these are like I'm turning outwards from being as more self-centered and trying to be more human centered, other centered, and that really helped me grow up. Um, the other thing that came to mind when you asked that is like. Um, how to say this, like I didn't, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a CEO and I sort of sort of thought like I could sort of slide into it without actually owning the responsibility and the seat and the position. So I thought like at the beginning, like I, we'll all just be one big group. We'll all be a flat team, or, flat yeah. and we're all colleagues and just we're all working yeah, hard. Smart, and smart, do your thing. Yeah, exactly. And that just doesn't work. Like as much as I tried to ignore that, um, other people were treating me, looked at me and said, that's the CEO. And so I, at some point, like two, three, maybe even four years into Yesware, I had to basically sit down and own that and be like, guess what? I'm the leader of this and I got to start acting like it. And that was, uh, you know, that took some time, but like, I kind of feel like the transition um, out of that role sort of sealed that part of the process for me. So when like, you became chairman, yeah, when I when I when I promoted Joel and became chairman, that was like the culmination of that. And I said, like, oh, no, I owned it. I did I it. I did it. I found someone who I, I thought could it. do it yeah, better for the next stage. And so now I feel like that those are two two developmental shifts that really helped. That's really cool, Matthew. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank Thanks you so very much, much, man. Bodeswell, Happy to do it. Uh, everybody, check it out. And yep. where do people find you online? Bodeswell.io, um, and um, at M Bellows at Twitter and LinkedIn and Matthew at Bodeswell.io. Check it out. All Thanks, right. man. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of Escape Velocity. Be sure to like and subscribe, and leave a comment with your biggest insight from our conversation. Be sure to check out the next episode.